Pegasus blows that out of the water, right? Because Pegasus was specifically for iOS, right? Hacking team was a big deal until they got hacked in 2015. So a zero day is a brand new exploit that hasn't been seen yet. They have your whole life. They have all your contacts, all your messages, turn on your camera, your mic, and listen in to what you're doing. <laughs> Big shout out to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. If you want to learn math or maths and computer science, there's no better place to learn than from Brilliant. Many topics, including statistics and probability. If you're interested in learning about artificial intelligence, AI, you need to have an understanding of maths or math, if you like, and an understanding of statistics and probability. Fantastic place to learn this kind of information. Now coming to my favorite part of Brilliant computer science. They teach you how to think in code. They teach computer science fundamentals, algorithms and data structures. They teach you Python programming and my all time favorite introduction to neural networks. So if you want an easy, intuitive, interactive way to learn, very important that it's interactive. You're involved in your training and studies here. Have a look at Brilliant. They are not only sponsoring my channel, really wanna thank them for doing that. It allows me to create a whole bunch of free content to make available to you. But they're also offering a 30 day free trial with 20% discount if you use my link below. Brilliant org forward slash David Bumble. Please check them out. Brilliant training from brilliant.org. Really want to thank them for sponsoring this video and supporting my channel. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with Occupy the Web. Occupy the Web, welcome. Thanks, David. It's always good to be back on your YouTube channel. I think you are doing a great job. I think you have the best YouTube channel for information security, cybersecurity of anybody that I have seen on YouTube. So I'm always happy to return. I really appreciate you saying that. Thanks so much. And just for everyone who hasn't seen our previous videos, I I've put links below. There's a whole big playlist where Occupy the Web goes through Mr. Robot Hacks. So have a look at those. He's also the author of these books. If you've seen our other videos, I've mentioned them a few times, but perhaps you haven't seen these books before. He's got Linux Basics for Hackers, very, very popular book on Amazon. I think it's like number one or something often, is that right? It's been, uh, it's number one for five years running. We're really happy. No Starch Press is very happy with it. I think a lot of people find it a really good book to get started into cybersecurity because it tries to be very simple, easy to understand Linux applied to cybersecurity and hacking. What I really love about your books and I'll say a few things now. Firstly, here's network network basics for hackers, as well as getting started becoming a master hacker. What I really love about what you do, and I, I always say this is, a unique, this is a unique skill that I don't see in a lot of people. You are very, very technical, but you have this ability to explain things simply. And um, I think we've had a discussion in the past about, you know, everyone, well, some people want me to do like these crazy hacks or you to do these crazy hacks on YouTube videos, but, the problem with that is the audience is small and you have this ability to you know, like bring the bring the complexity down so that everyone else can understand it. Thanks, David. I, that's what I try for. It's, that's my goal is to make uh, the complex simple because in reality, all of these things, and we're talking about cybersecurity, we're talking about IT, we're talking about networking, really they're, really, they're pretty simple things. And people try to make them much more complex than they really are. And you break it down no, it's, into, into its component parts, it's all pretty simple stuff. There's a saying, I can remember, I think it was Einstein that said it, you know, you know if someone understands something well, if they can explain it simply. Um, so people who don't quite understand it use complicated terms, but someone who can explain it simply actually understands what they're talking about. And that gets us to what we're talking about today. But before, I'm really excited about this actually, Pegasus is something that a lot of people have asked for. But I believe you've got a course coming up where you talk about Android hacking or demonstrate Android hacking, and you've actually got the software right. Right. We have the Android hacking class coming up in October, and we have the Android version of Pegasus that we'll be using in that class, among others, you know, malware that applies to Android hacking. So Pegasus is a, is a real special case. Because it's been it's been so widely used by governments around the world to spy, and so you know when we talk about Pegasus, we have to think about it in more than simply cybersecurity terms because it's being used it's being abused by governments around the world. It's been developed by the NSO group out of Israel. It's been sold to tens 
of governments, many of which who have terrible human rights records. It's been used to spy on human rights activists, journalists, what have you. And initially, its reason for being was to be able to spy on terrorists and, and other lawbreakers. But it's being abused by spying on a lot of people. And it's something that as the, you know, it might sound strange coming from a hacker, but it's something that we have to, as a global community, have to address is that what is legitimate and what's not. And, you know, this particular piece of malware that is capable of spying on anybody anytime uh, is, is running wild and it's disrupting a lot of people's lives and actually taking some people's lives. Um, so it's uh, it's something that I, I think that the viewers need to be aware of, um, and we'll talk more about some of the technical aspects of it. But you need to be aware, first of all, that it's being used and abused. And so those of you who you know, have may not be in the the good graces of your government, it's something that you really need to be aware of that at any point in time, they can go ahead and infect your phone and you don't know about it. And they can pull all of your messages, all of your emails. Uh, they can turn your camera on. They can turn your mic on. And you have no idea that this is taking place. So, um, that's kind of why I wanted to do this, and because it's kind of the state of the art of mobile device hacking right now. And it's in the news because it's been abused so much. Yeah. So before, before let's, I got a few slides I kind of wanted to show to talk a little bit about it from a, a technical aspect. Don't want to get too technical, but, you know, I don't want to, you know, we can get bogged down in the weeds here, but I want to talk a little bit about what's going on here with this particular piece of malware. It's interesting. I just read that, it, is it Armenia? They've just, uh, like, the, at the time of this recording it happened yesterday, that they found it in, like, a war zone. So it's, like you said, it's it's getting used all over the place, um, and it's going on people who are civilians, uh, so it's, like you say, getting abused a lot, it seems. Yeah, it's being abused in many countries, Armenia, as you mentioned, and a number of other places. You know, it's been used in Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Mexico. You know, you can just keep on going on with the list. One of the, it, it was first used in Mexico, and it was brought in by the government in Mexico to try to spy on the drug cartels. And uh, eventually, it got into the hands of the drug cartels. <laughs> and the drug cartels began to use it against you know, other people, journalists, what have you. It was been used in Mexico. I'm just picking on Mexico here, but Mexico it was actually used to spy on political opponents. The current president of Mexico, uh, Lopez Obrador, was actually, sp his family and his people were spied on by the opposition okay, and when he was running for office in 2018 using Pegasus. So, and, you know, there's the Khashoggi case in Saudi Arabia where it was used to spy on the uh, Jamal Khashoggi, and eventually it ended up leading to his death and dismemberment in Turkey. Uh, there's a number of uh, journalists and uh, uh, human rights activists who've been spied on by it, and some have lost their lives. So this is this goes beyond cybersecurity. This goes into privacy rights and human rights. And as you know, a global community, I think it's something that we need to talk about and address. And so from our from here, what we want to do is to talk a little bit about what it does, how it works. I think as a, a global community, we have to think about how do we address this? Is this legitimate? And, uh, and people um, may not be aware, but there is a industry of people who produce malware, zero-day malware, that is sold to governments, all right? And there's a number of these companies out there. This is legal hacking, 
All right. As long as you only sell it to the government. <laughs> and as long as it's sold to the government, it's legal, of course, because they make the rules. Uh, they make the laws. So it's legal. And, and they can use it any way that they want. So if you'll allow me, I'd like to share my screen. Okay, I just put together a few slides to discuss uh, Pegasus. Pegasus, developed by the NSO group, it can once it infects uh, a phone, it can you know extract SMS messages, other messaging apps, give geolocation, record video, record audio, pull the contacts out of your phone, and you know this is a really pernicious in that. Um, once it's on somebody's phone, it can pull all of the contacts out of their phone and, and find out all the people that they're talking to or messaging. And that could be really dangerous, especially if you're not in the good graces of your government, like you know, some of the more oppressive governments around the world. It comes in through a variety of, of actions, through the browser, uh, through SMS messages, the first thing that people may not be aware of, maybe hopefully you are, is that there are these companies around the world who develop zero days, right? And it's legal and legitimate, and they've been doing it. It's, a, it's an industry that's been around for a while. And what they do is they simply try to find vulnerabilities in phones and browsers and operating systems and applications, and then they sell them. Vupen has been around for quite a while. They're out of France. NSO, the one we're talking about today, is in Israel. Hacking team was a big deal until they got hacked in 2015. There's a Vupen has opened up a, a service called Zerodium, where they actually, it's kind of like a bug bounty program. They're buying zero days that they'll resell. So they're kind of like a broker of zero days. And then there's the equation group in the U.S. that uh, developed Eternal Blue and probably developed Stuxnet as well, the big SCADA attack against Iran in 2010. So these are some of the big players. There's many, many players in this field. In many cases, they'll sell zero days for millions of dollars to governments, all right? Sorry, some of the audience might not know. So zero day means like uh, with the, um, it's a vulnerability that the developers don't know about, right? Yeah, it's a zero day means that it's never been seen. So when it comes out, it's never been seen. So therefore, it's largely undetectable by any of our security devices. So for instance, antivirus, basically, Antivirus has evolved, but in the very beginning, what it was is simply a, a set of signatures of malware. So it had signatures of malware, and it could only detect what it knew about. So if it's never seen a malware, it doesn't have a signature, and therefore can't detect it. You know, in recent years, AVs got a little more sophisticated and can detect behavior, what looks like malicious behavior. So a zero day is a brand new exploit that hasn't been seen yet. And as such, it hasn't been patched, and there aren't any ways of detecting it. Right? So without getting into a lot of detail, here's the original Pegasus. All right. So stage one was a delivery in a WebKit vulnerability. It exploited CVE 2016, so it gives you an idea what time frame we're talking about here. All right, it comes down through an initial URL. So what it does is that it comes down through a web server. The, the person clicks on a link. Now, probably all of you have gotten malicious link. I get them every day. Maybe it's just me, but yeah. I I get malicious. No, no, I think a lot. <laughs> I think yeah. a lot of us do. Sorry, go yeah. On. So you get these you get these text messages, right? SMS messages. Yeah. And you know, it's always. Well, I, I can look at my phone right now and probably see a bunch of them. But it's always some, it's some offering. It's uh, either, you know, you've, you've won something. You know, the typical spam, phishing, uh, but the, now they're SMS messages. And so this is where Pegasus began, okay, as a single click. And if you clicked on that message, you then had malware downloaded to your phone, 
and it exploited a vulnerability in the web kit in the Safari browser on the iPhone. All right. The next stage, of course, was to jailbreak it. The stage was downloaded from the first stage code based upon the device. It's downloaded as an obfuscated and encrypted package. So what it's doing is that to get past any type of security device, such as AV, it's obfuscated, which means that the code has been changed in a way that it makes it more difficult to recognize what it actually is. And of course, then it's encrypted. So obfuscated means hard to, hard to see, hard to de- how to detect. Okay? Each package is encrypted with unique keys at each download. So each package is encrypted with unique keys, making traditional network-based controls ineffective. It contains code that's needed to exploit the iOS kernel. Right? So one of the things that this needs to do is it has to find the kernel within memory. So that's what's happening at this stage. It has to find the kernel within the memory to be able to run its exploit. And then in the final stage, it contains SB9 software, demons and other processes that are used uh, after the device has been jailbroken. And then once that SB9 software is put on the phone, they're basically what they're doing here is that they're placing a process. They're 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 embedding a process that can intercept text messages, your email messages, before they leave the phone. And then they send those out back through a chain of command and control servers that are based around the world. All right? So they're, they're sending out your text messages. And it's not necessarily a continuous process. The controller can request the messages periodically, right? The other kind of pernicious thing about this software is that it can be removed remotely so that if they believe that the user has detected Pegasus, they can just push a button and basically remove it from the machine, from the phone. And so it's really, really hard for people to be able to detect it or to even find, get copies of it, because as soon as it's detected, or anything that indicates that it's being detected, or if it's on the wrong kind of device, it automatically deletes itself. So this is the original, this was a single click. So it required that you know, the user clicked on an SMS message to be able to exploit it. In many cases, they were not able to get the target to click on the link. And so that raised problems for them. You know, you and I probably never click on those links that are sent to us from, exactly. from people we don't know. And this is the risk exactly. that if you go ahead and you click, and it's not just Pegasus because there's a lot of software out there, a lot of malware that if you click on it, they can download malware to your phone and then you've lost control and privacy of your phone. And... Our phone has become, you know, a, a reservoir for our entire life. So if somebody controls your phone, they have your whole life. They have all your contacts, all your messages. They can turn on your camera, your mic, and listen in to what you're doing. And this is what governments have been doing and using this for. And sometimes against people who, you know, we they probably should not be using. Yes, it has been used to stop some terrorist attacks. Yes, it has been done for law enforcement, but it's been abused as well against opponents of the governments, of you know, human rights activists, of journalists. There's been a number of journalists who've been killed as a result of the information that has been extracted from their phones by their governments, including Khashoggi, which is, who was a journalist in the United States, who was a Saudi citizen, living in the United States, writing for the Washington Post, who was then killed in Turkey and uh, dismembered in Turkey. In some cases, they couldn't get the user to click on a link. So what they did next is something that I've talked about earlier, and that is using a femtocell. We talked a little bit about this in terms of 
of uh, Mr. Robot. So this is kind of real world now. Mr. Robot's a, That's a TV show, you know. And so, but one of the I'll things, link that video below. Sorry, go on. Right. So the femtocell, if you're not familiar with it, is simply a local mobile cell tower. Right? So they are legal, and they're legal because some people are so distant from a cell tower, they don't have good reception. So the companies, in this case, it's Verizon, this is the largest carrier in the United States, they sell these okay, to help people who don't have good access to a cell tower, and it takes, it collects essentially the cell signal, it becomes a, it becomes a local, uh, near, uh, proximate cell tower, okay, within usually within a home or an office, and then puts sends a cell signal through the internet, all right, into the uh, cell network, and so this is what they were using in some countries to be able to put Pegasus malware onto the people's phones when they couldn't get them to click. They then would, would be able to get them to connect to a femto cell or, okay, and we have a class on building a femto cell coming up in September, I think. So keep that in mind. Or a stingray, okay? This is a stingray. And these are also legal, but only legal in the hands of law enforcement. <laughs> so this is, this is what many countries around the use around the world use to spy uh, on their citizens what it is is it's a mobile yeah, mobile it's a mobile cell tower so they can put it in a van in a truck what have you and move it any place and then once again your cell phone will connect to the closest cell tower your phone so that if there's a van parked in your neighborhood your phone will connect to that cell tower, in which case then the, the person who owns that cell tower can see all of your network traffic as well as put things into your network traffic. So in the case of Pegasus, they use either a femto cell or a stingray to be able to put malware into the target's phone when they couldn't get them to click on the link. And you can see this is a, here's a, this is one of the commercial, and there's a price list down below here. You can see what they cost for, you know, this one's $157,000, but supposedly you can only buy it if you're law enforcement or government. But these are widely used by governments to be able to spy on their, um, they're citizens used by law enforcement to be able to pick up traffic. In the United States, supposedly you need a search warrant to be able to uh, use one against a target. All right. So these have been used when they couldn't get people to click on a link. All right. So even if you yep. don't, the point I'm trying to make here is, is that even if you don't click on the link, you could still be at risk of being infected That's with Pegasus. This is still a one-click exploit, all right. And but if they can if they can connect to your cell phone with either a femto cell or a stingray, once the traffic is going through their device, they can go ahead and send back to your phone the malware. Okay, so in essence, oh, well. in essence, it's zero click, but it re requires that they actually know where you are and get in physical That's pro hard. proximity to you, and it's a little bit more expensive for them, more work for them. Now, in 20 and 2021, 2020 and 2021, they developed a zero-click exploit, all right? And this one was most, um, probably the most troublesome, all right, in that it required no interaction by the end user. It sent what it looked like a GIF image, okay, to the user's phone, to the iMessage, and basically it crashed this particular function right here, the J Big Two Stream, all right, and then installed the malware in that way. And so this is the one that has probably caused the most problems in recent years, is that uh, this is a zero-click 
You had nothing. You have no idea that it's been installed on your phone, and there's no indication that's on the phone. You've got somebody somebody sent you a message, an iMessage, and now they've taken over your phone. These are all been developed by NSO Group. This is Pegasus, right? And is probably should say is that Pegasus is not a piece of malware. It's multiple pieces of malware, and that NSO keeps on evolving it and keeps on changing to to adapt to the environment. So they come up with um, a, an exploit. Apple then patches it. They come up with a new exploit. Okay, Apple patches it, and so we're in this constant chess game of trying to keep this off our phones. And so it really opens up you know, some significant questions about privacy and, and human rights in the world. I'm not sure that how everybody, how if you want to address those kinds of issues, but this is something that is important, thinking about hacking and malware, and that you know malware and hacking Sometimes, you know, it was, well, for instance, ransomware was a financial issue, all right? It was, now, this is where we're getting into privacy issues, right? And this can be very pernicious, and it can make us all a little paranoid, and, and in essence, it can also make us um, concerned enough that we maybe don't don't talk in our messages on the phone in ways that we would if we felt that our uh, messages were private. So we end up being paranoid and maybe a little bit self-censoring of what we do on our phones because of the presence. So this has a, a dramatic effect upon society at large and not just you know, a, uh, you know, a loss of some financial uh, resources. Okay, by the way, iOS, well, people may have believed, it was often people thought that it's more secure than Android. Um, it's just, it, Pegasus blows that out of the water, right? Because Pegasus was specifically for iOS, right? Well, I would say that, that iOS is still more secure than Android, but this piece of malware was designed just initially for iOS and then was ported over to Android. Android. Android has a lot of vulnerabilities. A lot of people who are concerned about privacy, you know, people who are in the human rights field, people who are in journalism, usually are using an iPhone because they feel like it's more secure. But yeah. the Pegasus is targeted just to those type of people, right? There's lots of other malware that governments can use and hackers can use for the Android operating system, which, by the way, Android is over like 80% of the global market for operating yeah. systems on phones. A lot of people, I hear people say, well, you know, this, the world's 50% Apple and 50% Android. No. <laughs> it's, 80, Not at all, no. it's 82% of Android and 18% iOS and other things, right? So getting inside of an Android phone is a little bit easier than getting inside of an Apple phone. And that's why NSO can sell these. NSO sells, it makes, makes hundreds of millions of dollars selling this, all right? They charge about $25,000 per target, all right? So if a government wants to buy, you know, a thousand license, right? It's gonna cost them, what is that? You know, 200, um, $25 million, right? So, and governments are willing to pay it, and, and they do. Oh, yeah. uh, and so they've, uh, this, is, this has caused a lot of problems around the world, and it continues to cause a lot of problems around the world. And it's something that we need to be, you know, your viewership needs to be aware of, and everybody who has a phone should be aware <laughs> that this is something that's out there, and it's being uh, exploited daily on our phones. I think uh, the, so. The, the the question is always, what do we? What what can we do? Like a normal person, well, is it, um, just keep it up to date. Uh, I know Apple released lockdown mode, 
which is something that's supposed to supposedly supposed to stop this kind of thing. But like you say, they keep developing new exploits. Right. Well, as far as what we can do, first of all, you know, never click on a link from anybody you don't know. <laughs> and and sometimes that's hard to do because one of the ways to get people to click on links is to take over somebody else's phone, okay, and send out links from their phone in their contact list. So it looks like it's coming from somebody you know. Right? And then you go, and that's what happened in a number of these journalists is that they were sent out, you know, from somebody's phone who got compromised, and then they sent out more of the links, SMS messages, text messages to other people and got all of their friends got infected and all their contacts got infected as well. So the first thing to do is probably to not. Not click on any links on SMS in general. Uh, probably is the best thing you can do. The but that doesn't solve the problem of the zero click exploits that are out there. And I think we all have to. Couple things we can do is that one, we 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 have to be more demanding of our developers, and that in this case it's Apple and Google to be more responsible to develop safe and secure software. All right. If the software that they developed was secure, this wouldn't be possible. Now, it's pretty hard to put out software that has no vulnerabilities in it. But you know, these are both very, very large corporations with billions of dollars. And I think we need to demand that of them, that they make their operating systems and their applications. Because this is, you know, these are this isn't just the operating system. This is a kind of a linked exploit between the application and the operating system. Uh, in this case here, this was a, this was this zero day that was a zero click um, was a, a flaw in the way that it handled uh, it actually it sends it out as a GIF, but it's really a JPEG2 image and then it gets processed by this particular uh, function here, and it overflows it, causes it to crash, installs its own software in its place, and the game's over at that point. I think the uh, the cynic in, uh, in me and other people might say the same thing. It's um, governments are not enforcing it because they want this. It's you know that's just a cynical take on it. Yeah, I think that that's that's true. Although the U.S. government has banned NSO products now. Okay, so, uh, but that does, you know, that, that may be just that, you know, they may still be using it internally, but that's externally what they're saying is that they have a ban on NSO products. And then, you know, we have a the lot. The Sonic in May says they just, they're getting the NSA version. Sorry. Yeah, just, exactly. Yeah, it's <laughs> the, the NSO version is not, so they're, they're getting the same thing from somebody, you know, somebody else, whether it be Vupen or, hacking team or what have you. So yeah, they've banned NSO products. Uh, the interesting thing about NSO is that whenever NSO sells any software to a government, they have to have the Israeli Department of Defense approval. So when they're selling it to these governments and they're abusing it, there is a certain amount of level of responsibility that goes back to the Israeli Department of Defense because they're approving the sale. And if you're proving the sale to a, com a country that has you know, a terrible human rights record and you know is abusing it and you're not doing anything about it, then there's a certain amount of responsibility here. For instance, in, in Morocco, where it's been used um, you know, against anybody who's opposed to the king in Morocco. And it has ended up with many people in prison and being murdered by the king in Morocco. Um, and a number of other places as well, just picking on Morocco. But, you know, it's been used uh, in Jordan, uh, Kazakhstan, Iraq, Hungary, India. I mean, you can just make a list. And even in France, I mean, France, it was used against Macron. The president of France was being, his phone was, was hacked with uh, Pegasus. And so somebody was listening in, and it's suspected that it was the Moroccan authorities who were listening in on Macron's conversations. And so what are these players, you know, the governments of the world, going to do 
I mean, it's, if it's being used against your government, for instance, in Mexico, it was used against uh, Lopez Obrador, uh, yet it's still actively being used by the Mexican government as best as we can tell. And it's been the early versions, the version that had the one click, got found its way into the hands of the drug cartels, all right? And they were using it against their opponents, including the government and including journalists who might have something negative to say about them. So it's uh, it's problematic and it's something that, you know, as a global community, we have to start thinking about is how do we handle this is a new world that we're talking about here how do we handle this do we just allow this to take place is there is there no limits on this when you're talking about intrusion upon privacy this raises all new issues for all of us i mean there's we've had malware and viruses around for 30 40 50 years right i guess we the first ones were 1980s or thereabouts. Um, but now we're talking about a loss of privacy. And I think that's a, I think privacy, you know, people may disagree with me, I think privacy is a basic human right. Um, and this is, this puts that human right at risk. All right. Um, so I think it, it raises all new issues that we, we need to address. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's complicated. I mean, it's. Um, I wanted to ask you some other questions like, if you get hold of the software, do you need the command and control infrastructure or can, like, the cartels, were they able to just do their own thing, like use the software for their own purposes without, you know, getting permission and whatnot? The circumstances in Mexico are unique, let's put it that way. And you do need the command and control infrastructure. Which, by the way, we have a class coming up in August on command and control infrastructure. So those people are interested in that. So I mean, when you're going ahead and you're spying on somebody or you're trying to extract uh, revenues from them, you need to have some way of, of ex exfiltrating the data off their phone or other devices. That requires a command and control infrastructure. And in this case, the Pegasus has a very complex command and control infrastructure that's very hard to detect. And all the transmissions are done in encrypted, making it more difficult to actually see and detect them. And in addition, if they feel that the target or law enforcement in that community has detected them, they can immediately delete the software. That's why it's become really, really hard to get samples of this software because NSO deletes it, okay, as soon as they detect any kind. Like, for instance, if you go in and you start trying to detect the processes, and there's a number of processes, one of the interesting things about the software is that, and it's something that I, I teach my students too, is that, if you're going to create a malicious process, make it a process of something that runs in the background, a demon, right? It's a process that runs in the background constantly. Give it a name that looks almost identical to a native process on that particular device, right? And it makes it really, really hard for the forensic analyst or you know, whoever is doing the incident response to detect it. And, uh, and that's what they did here. Almost all of the processes that are running on the iPhone have names that are almost identical to the names of native processes on those devices, making it really, really hard for anybody to be able to find them. Even people who have a lot of experience, it's hard to detect them. Uh, and I have to give you know a little bit of credit to the NSO people. I mean, they're a very talented group of developers, right? They spend days, weeks, months, years developing these. So that kind of raises an issue that you and I have talked about in the past, and that is that you know hacking can be a very time-consuming and tedious process. When you start talking about zero days, a company like NSO or the Equation Group, or Vupen, or Hacking Team, they can have really good developers working months and years to develop a zero day. 
And then, of course, they can sell it for millions of dollars, but they invest a lot of time in it. So, yes, you can take over systems in 30 seconds or less, like in the TikTok videos. But those are, <laughs> but, but those are only insecure systems, right? Those are insecure systems. When you're talking about secure systems, you know, it becomes a lot more complex. And so my message to students and to viewers is that don't get frustrated and don't expect that every, you can exploit everything in 30 seconds or less. You can exploit insecure systems in 30 seconds or less, but that's not going to necessarily apply to a secure system, right? Like a new iPhone, right? That yeah. could take you years to develop a zero day and a lot of knowledge and skill and resources to do that. And these companies like NSO do that. And the NSA in the United States and the Equation Group in the U.S. and a number of other companies and entities around the world are doing it. But most of the time when you see a big hack, it often has an element of social engineering involved in it. The successful ones, even here, we were talking about the Pegasus. It required some social engineering. So we go back and we look at the one click, right? These were, these were social engineering attacks. There was somebody yep. sending a message who knew something about the person that would get them to click on a link. All right? So even when we're talking about the most sophisticated hacking in the world, it still has an element of social engineering. And that's why I always tell my people is that you should not overlook social engineering. If NSO group has to have an element of social engineering, then you probably do too. <laughs> or for that matter, whether it be you know, the Russian um, FSB, GRU, I mean, they all use social engineering. So don't feel like that's a that's a, a lower level of hacking because even the most sophisticated hackers in the world use elements of social engineering to get what they need. Now, it's a lot easier to hack a system when you can entice the user into an action. If you can entice the user into an action, social engineer, it's a lot easier to take over whatever device it is. And that's the case here with the NSO Group's Pegasus. It applies to, you know, if you look at all of the major hacks, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I emphasize the history of hacking in my book, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker, because on almost all of the major hacks, if you look at all the big ones, there's a social engineering aspect of it, right? And so we're talking about the major hacks in history. Very few of them did not have a social engineering element. Even you know, Stuxnet had to find a way into that facility because it was basically an air gap facility. It required some social engineering to get probably the most sophisticated piece of malware ever developed into that uranium enrichment facility. Here, Pegasus, initial Pegasus, required at least the user click on a link. The more recent ones have zero click. Um, Eternal Blue is a good example of a zero click exploit. So Eternal Blue, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is an exploit that was developed by the Equation Group for the NSA, and basically it exploited SMB on server message block protocol. And it's on almost every machine, every Windows machine. It's on every Linux machine as well. An implementation of it is. And it exploited SMB to basically take over the system. And it required no interaction by the user. This is rare. This is very rare. Now, in the 90s, it wasn't rare. Right? <laughs> or, or in the early years of the 21st century. But in a more secure world that we're working in in 2023, it's very, very rare that you can develop a piece of malware that has that requires no user interaction. And if you are, you know, you're gonna spend many, many person hours and years being able to develop it. Uh, there are some 
pieces of the uh, the early versions of the iOS Pegasus out there and available for analysis. The class that we're doing in October is an Android, so we'll be looking at a number of pieces of Android malware, including the, the Pegasus version of Android. And the Android version goes by a slightly different name. But yeah, they call it Creasar, which is the twin brother of Pegasus. There's been a lot less research done on the Android version of Pegasus. And so it might be a lot more prevalent than we know. What most of the research has been done is on the iPhone version of Pegasus because it was originally discovered in the phone of a human rights activist in Bahrain, I think in 2016. And so Amnesty International has focused a lot of their research on the iOS version of Pegasus. And there's been a lot less research that's been done on the uh, Android version. So it might be all over the place. We just don't know. So Occupy the Web, obviously because of this is YouTube, we have to be really careful what we show. Uh, thanks so much for showing a slide of the of the actual part of the code that was a problem. Um, you said that you've got a class coming up in October, right? That where you're going to look at the Android version and you've actually got the software and you'll go through that, right? Yes, we have uh, the Android version of Pegasus known as Cresor. And, uh, but I always say simply the Android version of uh, Pegasus. And we'll be analyzing it as well as other Android malware that, uh, and we're just focusing in this class on Android. That's great. I mean, so I know people who are watching are going to want to like see the code. Um, but yeah, this is YouTube. So we've got to be really careful. So if you really want to, you know, see it actually working, um, and have Occupy the Web explain it to you and, and, and show you other malware, then sign up for his class. I put links below. Occupy the Web, I really want to thank you for sharing your knowledge. I always say this. I mean, like I said in the beginning, your books are amazing. You have a, an amazing ability to explain complex stuff simply. And I thank you so you know, thanks so much for coming on YouTube and you know, just sharing the knowledge. We've done a lot of videos together and, and I appreciate you doing that and look forward to the next ones. Thanks, David. I always enjoy being on your show and uh, I'm looking forward to doing a, a little more technical one on the Eternal Blue exploit in the near future. Yeah, just so for everyone who's watching, the idea there is you're going to do a demo, right, with Windows 10 or something and show us how it actually works. Right. It yeah. was originally developed for Windows 7, but it's been reported for Windows 8 and Windows 10, and it works against uh, those versions under certain circumstances, like you know, like everything. There has to be certain circumstances, yeah. and, and it's actually a overwrite of two buffers between SMB1 and SMB2. So in the cases where a machine has both of those versions on it, it will work. So that's great. So for everyone who's watching, please put in the comments below other topics that you want us to cover. If there's anything that you think will be will be great, put in the comments below. I read a lot of the comments and Occupy the Web and I discuss those and see what, what, what would be interesting to cover. Occupy the Web, thanks. Thanks, David. See you again soon.